Welcome, everyone. My name is Zanner, so some of you know me as Daniel. I am the DM to our playthrough, uh, forgive me, our D&D game of Legion every Thursday here on Frankly I Don't Give a Fork. And today we are hosting our little podcast about the wicked things in history, wicked people, wicked events, and sometimes just strange and bizarre. Welcome to Something Wicked. And with me today are my co-hosts, Francisco and Emily. Say hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. With, uh, with that being said, could us, could we all just take a moment, enjoy the weather outside and this daylight saving sign that has been utterly and completely kicking my ass and making me not sleep well. I hope that all of you are doing better. But on today's subject, we are speaking about vampirism. Vampires, the undead, the Nosferatu, the vampire. Their history, some of knowledge, but mostly what I want to bring to the table. Is it a possibility of there actually being a human vampire? And I'm hoping to be able to answer that question for you by the end of our hour. With that being said, let us all take a moment to get something warm, something sweet. Sit down and relax and listen to my voice. And let us prick our thumbs for something we could this way come. Now, tell me, what do you guys know about vampires? Um, a fair bit since I had to do research uh, for a campaign uh, that we're hmm. currently running and a campaign that I've run in the past, which was actually being real life human vampires and how that could theoretically work. So a fair bit. <laughs> So what do you know? Tell me. I'm curious. Well, since well, since I gave you some of your sources to work with, um, mm -hmm. so I do know that there are deficiency iron deficiencies in people that they do there that are deficiencies. uh that where one of the cures uh cures quote unquote is to drink blood. I also know that a uh I always I don't know how to pronounce it. I've always read it. So the hydro hypohydratic a Ector dysplasia. Thank you. Yes, where your skin becomes like paper thin. Uh, you look like white as a ghost. Um, you have your iron deficiency there, and it that is very close to vampirism. Um, so Fran and I have done a lot of extensive research for my campaigns. And and in my case also, it's just idle curiosity. Uh, the two most interesting things that that I think should be brought up is all the way back to in ancient Greece, there have been stories of blood drinkers and the undead. Correct. And one thing I found very interesting is one theory of vampire sightings in the medieval era, mm. and Victorian era especially, is that bodies were being dug up because they thought they were vampires, and they would dig up a body with flushed, rosy cheeks and blood around the mouth. Modern scientists mm. believe that these were tuberculosis victims who... Correct. As you're decomposing, all that blood and fluid build up <clears> in the lungs, it comes out the mouth, and it looks like they drank blood from somebody. And what I think that is, is correct. What I think is kind of amazing, like how we get our modern trait day vampires that are so well established. They have the fangs, they drink the human blood. Um, it's it's fantastic because they weren't always so clearly defined at one point not in even time. close yes not even close and as a matter of fact the human vampire is a new invention but please continue on hmm so what is a vampire for us is an undead body craving the blood of the innocent to be able to continue its rampage against the world charismatic debonair Chilling, manipulating, uh, it wasn't always like that. Actually, the Mesopotamians and the Babylonians speak of it first. And that's kind of the funny, weird thing about it. Because for most people, what a lot of people don't believe is that we wind up having... Bram Stoker's Dracula because of Vlad the Impaler. Mm. And then we go and we have all these other things. But there's actually quite a few books that open that up. But before we get into that, I'm actually going to talk about 
not the modern day incarnation, the biblical one. Hold on, because it gets real weird real quick. So I know that when we hear about immortals and things like that, a lot of people think of Cain, that Cain would have been one of the first would-be vampires, that he had the mark of Cain, all these other things, but he doesn't hold any of the characteristics of the actual vampire. But there are two sentences, two uh, verses in, in the uh, New King James, uh, forgive me, mm. the uh, King James test, uh, good Lord, and in the King James Bible, blah, 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 even saying it hurts my tongue, that uh, in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 14, there's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 8, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So, you ask yourself, where does that come from? What the hell are we talking about? Are they just talking about ravenous, scary-looking people? Or are they talking about, you know, actual demonic-type things? So the Babylonians believed, for the most part, that vampires were demons and that actually drunk blood because they had no other choice. They were vile creatures and, and that needed to uh, sustain themselves through destroying innocence and so on and so forth. Now, one of the bigger ones, give me one second so I can get that for you guys, starts off in Mesopotamia. In Babylon, in Babylonia, there are tales of the mythical Lilithu, which is also synonymous with Lilith, who sadly gets kind of the brunt of, of that and mm -hmm. winds up being seen as a demonic creature because she was drinking the blood of children and of women. Um, well, also because she slept with Adam, refused to sleep under Adam, she was cast out. Adam. Correct. She was cast out, that is correct. And then we have the Greeks. That they go on, they mention the streaks who would prey on young babies and their mothers at night. And then Hebrew law, which I did not know this, Hebrew law actually has a very, very big aversion mm -hmm. against the consumption of human flesh. Correct. And the drinking of any type of blood. It is considered sinful beyond belief. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the creature as the Sumer, which was described as an infertile, beautiful maiden was believed to be a heartless and vampire who, having chosen a lover, would never let him go. And then we get um, one of my favorites, the Babylonian goddess Lamatsu, or um, as some other people are going to call, I, um, there's, there's another thing called the Galu and the Utu, but I'm not sure if they fall into the same in that one. And Lamatsu is a historically older image. So Lamatsu is a... It has the face of a lion, the talons of an eagle, the face of a lion, the ears of a donkey, and the teeth of a donkey, but with two large fangs that protrude out of its mouth to be able to render the flesh and to be able to consume blood. And in ancient Greece, we have the impusa, the lamina, and the strigs. Now, this is where it gets kind of funny, because as I was doing research for this, there is supposedly supposedly and i say this one real real big in a supposed because i literally only found this in certain places and there's no real scientific anything to it is that there is a answer to the first vampire question the scriptures of delphi specifically in the collection of writings known as the vampire bible quote unquote that the first vampire was a gentleman by the name of Ambrosio, an Italian-born adventurer whose fate brought to Delphi in Greece. He wanted a reading from the oracle so badly that he began to fall in love. And Apollo, you know how the gods can get. So they, he wasn't too happy about the fact that somebody was trying to go and steal away one of his oracles. So Apollo the sun god, in a fit of rage, cursed Ambrosio, so that his skin would burn should it ever touch sunlight again. Ambrosius' bad luck followed when he ended up gambling away his soul to Hades, 
the god of the underworld. The next curse came via Apollo's sister, Artemis, the goddess of the moon and hunting, who made it so that Ambrosia's skin would burn if you touched silver. But, supposedly, Artemis, taking pity on the young man, gave him the gift of immortality. He would carry his curses, his skin burning by sunlight or silver, but he would live forever in his current form. Not only that, but Artemis also gave him speed and strength to become a hunter whose skill was second only to her own. Now, the bloodsucking is supposedly part of that blessing. In the vampire original story, Ambrosio hunts swans and uses their blood as ink to write down love poems to his lady Selene. While this may be considered a little creepy, by our standards, it wasn't at all that unusual in ancient Greece to do when you hunted. I looked and 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 I couldn't find squat to go and prove that. But it sounds nifty, doesn't it? I'm going to back it a lie. It really does. But I will mention to you probably one of my favorite ones is in a modern history of vampires from Scientific America. The only news article from Medveda, Serbia, in January 1732, to speak of that. In the Carpathian Mountains, ominously to the east, of there was rumor that there were vampires, creatures that were feeding on the village. Forty villages were exhumed that morning. A total of 13 had been identified as vampires. Fresh blood seeped from their mouth, nose, or the gaping wounds in their chest where the stake had been pounded in. Nugo was clear evidence of the demonic guilt. Dr. Johannes Fulkinger, regiment medical officer dispatched by the Honorable Supreme Command, surveyed the ghastly scene. He was clearly uneasy about being sent to the small village in the remote edge of the Habsburg Empire. His disgust of the local Hajduks were evident as he gazed upon a newborn child who, because of a careless burial, had been half-eaten by dogs. The young doctor hunched over what had once been a child's mother, a 20-year-old peasant woman named Tatana, and proceeded with his dissection. He noted that she was quite complete and undecayed, despite dying in childbirth two months earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Like the others, her blood had not coagulated, and after prying open her ribcage, she documented that her lungs, liver, and spleen were still fresh. The woman's skin was described as fresh and vivid. She had a pool of extravascular blood in her stomach and chest cavity. The only interpretation that could be is that the creature had turned into a vampire. She had risen from her grave to feast on the blood of the living. After the examination taking place, Fulkinger wrote in his official report, the heads of the vampires were cut off by the local gypsies and then burned along with the bodies, and then their ashes were thrown into the river Morava. And to top that off, there, and you can all find this in a book as well called Woman in the Ottoman Balkans, um, written by Amelia Butrovic and Irvin Semil Schick. Um, the first to be transformed, Fulkinger learned from the Siberian villages, was a former soldier by the name of Arnold Howley, who had fled his post in Turkey after being troubled by a vampire there. However, after settling in the village and being betrothed to his neighbor's daughter, Pauli met with a sudden and unexpected death. Not long after, people began to report seeing Pauli wandering around the village after nightfall. Some swore that he had even attacked them. They was reserved, taking the shape of a black dog as though hunting prey. More than 20 people mysteriously died in the village since Pauli met his ultimate end. Pauli attacked not only the people, Fulkinga reported, but also the cattle and sucked out their blood. There were two ways that vampirism was being spread in Medveda. Some were bitten directly, while others had eaten the infected meat and become vampires as well. So, apparently, once they were turned, vampires not only behaved as though possessed by wild beasts, they could also adapt the beastly shape or transmit the vampirism through animals to an unsuspecting human victim. In order to end Arnold Powell's reign of terror, the villagers of Medvev drove a stake through his heart, according to their custom, whereby he gave an audible groan and bled copiously. 
This is an actual report. <laughs> Which is insane. I I still can't wrap my head around that, that that actually happened. That that's a real report. <laughs> what the hell? Could you imagine? Going into Serbia out of all places. The coldest of the cold to have to deal with that nonsense. Well, if you think that's funny, you live right next to 5,000 vampires. What? Uh, the, ah, yeah. the Atlantic Vampire Alliance. Oh. <laughs> you, know, you know, Em, if you can, please elaborate for, for <laughs> the people that are listening. So... I'm so sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> el elaborate for our listeners. Who are the Atlantic Vamp uh, the Atlanta Vampire Alliance? There and... are thousands of real life vampires walking among you in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, and in Louisiana. Yes. But a, mo but a very big chunk of them in Atlanta, but please. Uh, there are self-identified uh, vampires oh. who drink blood from willing animals or not willing willing humans or animals um because they claim they need it to survive they <laughs> they they are normal people normal quote unquote normal from families uh marriages uh mm -hmm. that just they believe they have vampirism huh yeah and um I want you all to know that M is not exaggerating. Um, there is another big study of this in March 26 of 2015 by John Edgar Browning from the Georgia Institute of Technology when they dwelled into two, in 2009. That's um, the one in the same. This is the same one that has done this, that's reported on the Atlanta. Yep. But he started in New Orleans because and the New Orleans folk pointed him to Atlanta, which is wild. So he believes that he eventually met around 35 real vampires, but the total number in New Orleans is easily double that. The range in age from 18 to 50 and representing both sexes equally. They practice his sanguinarian blood and his psychic feeding, taking energy using, for example, the mind or hand. <sighs> Some psychic vampires use tantric feeding, that is through erotic or sexual encounters, while others use what could be described as astral feeding, or feeding on another from afar, and others feed through emotion. I tell you what. Hmm. Funny that you should mention feeding through emotion. There's also a sublet of zanies. Um, what? Uh, where oh, oh do, do tell, because I feel like if though I don't have as much knowledge as you do right now. What, what, Zanies what are, is a zany? Those are people that feed off of emotions, uh, specifically negative emotions. Uh, so either inflicting pain or pain that just happens to happen to them, they feed off of that. Which, depending who asks, a lot of people would consider oh. incubi or succubi a form of vampire. Mm-hmm. So, while we're talking about this, let's talk about real vampires for a moment. Oh, yes. So, the folklorist Stu Burns indicated that the word vampires arrived from the early Slavic word upir, mm. found in an 11th century Russian manuscript. The word upir was westernized to vampire in the 18th century. So... And one of the one, and one of the things I didn't know is that, and you know, to give you a little bit of knowledge of the modern day vampire, the vampire myth seems to have some largely from Gothic European literature, eighteen nineteenth centuries, about the same time that vampire hysteria was peaking in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, the very first thing that we see though is the eighteenth century poetry, such as Heinrich August Ossenfelder's *De Vampire*, seventeen forty eight, about a seemingly vampiric narrator who seduces an innocent maiden. Vampire, vampire poems began appearing in English about the turn of the 19th century, such as John Stagg's The Vampire, 1810, and Lord Byron's The Gior in 1813. The first prose vampire story published in English is believed to be John Polidori's The Vampire, 1890, about a mysterious aristocrat named Lord Rufin, who seduces young women only to drain their blood and disappear. Those works and others inspire subsequent material for the stage, 
Later, important vampire stories, including the serial Barney, the Vampire, or the Feast of Blood, 1845 to 47, the Mysterious Stranger in 1853, which are cited as possible early influences for Bram Stoker's Dracula, 1897, and Theophile Gantier's Le Mort Amorous, The Dead Lover, and Sheridan Le Fon's Camilla, 1871 to 72, which established the vampire femme fatale. The very first female vampire with all of Dracula's powers and all that fun stuff. And I think it's worth noting that many of these vampires, particularly Carmilla and and to an extent Dracula, if if you read if you read them and kind of pay attention, they're kind of sort of clear coded. Mm. And this is because oh, very times in the Victorian times, homosexuality or sexual deviancy was something to be afraid of. You know, gay people Which, were thought of as predators and parasites. So oh, but let's be honest, the queer coding villains has been. A thing since silent films. Mm -hmm. Why do villains dress better? Why do they speak better? Why do they sound feminine when they speak? There's a really good documentary about that. And there's also a book, I believe it's called The War on Homosexuality, speaking about how homosexuality was seen as evil. That's the reason why you have very flamboyant, quote unquote, villains and whatnot. But that's besides the point. That could be a whole other episode of something wicked, really, but you know. Now let's get to the stuff I can actually I actually know a little bit about. Sorry. So, which some of you may not know this, your boy's got a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. So I get excited when I do these things. So, the evolution of blood drinking in animals. I found a really good article by the professor of biology and curator of mammals, Dr. Robert J. Baker, and his postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Caleb D. Phillips of the Texas Tech University. Before we continue on, so you guys don't have to go searching for all of these sources, they will be in our Discord server. All of mm -hmm. them will be posted for you to look at and do, do your own research. Oh, yeah. We, we love showing it to all of you. Mm -hmm. And these guys, you could tell that they weren't really about the myth stuff. They really just wanted to go and get, like, knowledge out, which I thought was great. Um, so let's talk about the vampire bat. The members of a large and diverse mammalian family known as as the Philo Philostomidae, New World Leaf Nose Bats. At least 160 known species of bats are in this family. Most of the species feed primarily on fruit and other plant material, while others feed on insects, nectar, frogs, or are omnivores. There's only three vampire species that feed on blood. The common vampire bat, Desmodus rotundus, which I love the fact it's called Desmodus rotundus because it's literally small, round, <laughs> Rotunda should be a little cat name. And the white winged vampire bat, that is the Diamus Yongi, and the hairy laid vampire bat, Diphilia equidata. So, recent genetic studies have determined that the vampires diverged from the remainder of the Philolostomid family about 26 billion years ago. Blood feeding is thought to have evolved only once and a common ancestor that is shared by the three vampire bats of today. Vampire bats is believed, through genetic studies, have evolved from insect-eating bats that were feeding on the parasites of birds and mammals. The bats were consuming a partial diet of blood, the blood that the parasites had eaten. And when they pulled the parasites off the bird or mammal, they were further exposed to the blood at the attachment site. Behaviorally, it would not be a large leap for the bats to begin feeding directly on blood. This view is supported by observing other animals that feed in a familiar manner. For example, although obligate, meaning compelled or constrained, required to survive, blood feeding has evolved only once among vertebrates, vampire bat. Some species of birds, such as the vampire finch, also feed on the ectoparasites of other birds and occasionally consume some blood at the site when the ectoparasites are attached. But the amount of specialization that has to happen, what happens to an animal to make it built for it? You had the evolution of the anticoagulants in the saliva, modifications to the teeth, psychological adaptations for digesting blood and excreting excess water, anatomical changes to facilitate preying on sleeping mammals or roosting birds, sensory adaptions to the prey and blood flow sites, the ability to sense 
the warmth of a vein. That's insane to me. And then by comparing the proteins expressed in the saliva vampire bats, insectorvious bats, and medicinal leeches, Doctors Baker and Phillips have shown that many of the salivary plant uh, proteins important for blood feeding, such as anticoagulants, are found in both vampire and leech saliva. One of the remarkable aspects of the discovery is that the evolutionary lineages that led to vampire bats and leeches diverged more than 500 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion. Dr. Baker and Phillips discovered that many of these salivarial proteins found in vampire bats and leeches have been recruited to adapt the roles in blood feeding from gene families that were present in their common ancestor. Meaning, when we had that big evolutionary explosion, somehow, some way, leeches and vampire bats wound up with the same gene to be able to pull this shit off. That's amazing, isn't it? That's so fun. I think that's so great. I love the fact that that's even a thing. But yes, so we have that. So is it possible for human beings to be able to drink blood? Yes and no? Well, technically, consuming human flesh is, unless you have that genome in you, you're not able to. But blood does not constrict with it, so... There is no issue. <laughs> it, there, there's no issue other than morality than drinking human well, blood. Sort of, kind of. Very high in protein, very low in vitamins, mm. and you can actually wind up having iron poisoning from drinking too much blood. You can actually shut down your kidneys and your gallbladder, which I did not know. Did not but, know that. Mm-hmm. Since extremely high in protein, like it will get you to where you need, but you're not getting anything else. So could you drink blood? Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but there's also a very high amount of parasites in blood. So if you're drinking animal blood, I would highly recommend that you get it from a reputable source. Not saying that us here in Something Wicked are saying that you should do that. Please do not. Yeah. But just kind of throwing that out there. <laughs> but where does it come from? different medical diseases Hypo yes and one of the fun ones hypohydrontic ectodermal dysplasia or HED is that actually how you pronounce it because I just like I read that so many times I'm like ah, eh. like it was like ah uh, this word yeah <laughs> no I didn't even try I'm like ah uh, this word yeah I just <laughs> no, no. bypassed it <laughs> No, no, let we, from here on in, we're going to call it HED, because if I have to say that every single time, I'm going to swallow my own tongue. <laughs> it's, a, it's a genetic skin disease. Common symptoms include sparse scalp and body hair, reduced ability to sweat, and missing teeth. HED is caused by mutations in the EDA, EDA, or EDA, RA, DD genes. It is inherited in an X-linked recessive, autosomal recessive, or autosomal dominant manner meaning it is a genetic defect literally acquired through sex. It is through gender that this is given. So the X-link form in the most, is the most common form. The forms have similar signs and symptoms. However, the autosomal dominant form tends to be the mildest. This can cause overheating, removal of um, ear and nose con con concretions, for some strange reason, they secrete a foul liquid from their nose because of this. There's an actual actor that has this as well. He's very tall. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want anybody poking fun at the poor guy. But there is an actor who's been in a lot of you know, monster movies with this condition. He's a taller looking gentleman. But you can definitely go and tell that, in all frankness, he bears a similarity of the Nosferatu, of the long ears of the pointed teeth and things like that. Yes. But again, I want us to take a moment to really think of what what would make people think this? And then we have let me find it real. Are you thinking porphoria? Yes. And there is a great 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 article 
Born to the Purple, the Story of Porphyria. Porphyrins are light-activated chemicals that can be used to combat ills, including tumors and diseases of the eye. But, with the wrong forms of them built up in the body, they cause a disease called porphyria. Named from the ancient Greek word porphyra, meaning purple. What will happen then? I'm sorry, I'm so excited that you're getting into porphyria because... I went down a bit of a rabbit hole with this. Oh, uh, did you? Yes, because... You, then tell me, tell me, what do you know? So it's amazing because if you have... Well, it's not amazing, but it is amazing. So if you have Phyphoria, I am so sorry for you. Like, you have it, extreme it's sensitivity to sunlight, and, like, it can actually cause, like, disoriented uh, vision and, like, blackened skin and hair, weird hair growth and weird places. You actually oh, get yes. fangs. And it looks like you drink blood because your urine comes out red more times than not. And you're mm -hmm. actually allergic to garlic. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you are. Um, now, the, now, the wild part about that is that it's believed that there's a, a, a good chunk of that in Transylvania. Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited you're getting into this because this is what my entire campaign was based off of because they, oh, did, yeah. they did not want fake vampires. They wanted realistic vampires. So Oh, I understand. Oh, I'm I so excited. Totally understand. So let's get into it. Scientific America speaks of Porphyria. So the Greeks borrowed the term from the Phoenicians who extracted a purple pigment from purpura mollusk to dye garments for the royal family. Later in the Byzantine Empire, the term porphyrogenitos, or born to the purple, literally meant that the imperial heir was born after the father's ascension to the throne in a palace room draped in purple. However, those with the misfortune to be born to the purple involved in porphyria, a group of diseases that result from abnormal accumulations of red and purple pigments produced by the body, called porphyrians, receive less, far less than royal treatment. There are at least eight types of porphyria, which vary substantially in the symptoms of severity. Now, to get a good understanding of that, light-activated toxins. Hippocrates is often cited as the first recognized porphyria, which was then referred to as blood liver disease. But the casual role of porphyrian pigments was only established in 1871 by the German pioneer of biochemistry, Felix Hopsier, in 1886. Dr. B.J. Stovkis described the chemical clinical syndrome as porphyria, and from then, no more um, on more and more forms of the syndrome were discovered. But these are the things that they all have in common. They each result from faults in the body's hem building machinery. Hem, a component of the oxygen transporter hemoglobin, is made in a sequence of eight steps, as in a factory assembly line. Each step is catalyzed by a separate enzyme. In any of these eight steps fail because of an inherited genetic mutation or environmental toxin, which we're going to talk about in a second, then the whole assembly line goes to hell. The products um, can include earlier steps or porphyrin intermediates may build up to toxic levels. These porphyrins accumulate in the skin and other organs before being excreted in the feces and urine, which may turn to a port wine color. Exposed to light, the porphyrins can cause caustic and destroy surrounding tissue which is insane um so when porphyrins accumulate depends on the side of the jam and it is this that gives porphyria such a wide range of symptoms the severity of the jam also varies in some cases the jam is total preventing any hem synthesis at all usually resulting in death in others, it is only partial, permitting limited hem synthesis. The blockage of the assembly line also means that the body cannot make enough hem to produce normal red blood cells. Some of these abnormal red blood cells rupture, leading to hemolytic anemia, while the spleen detects abnormalities in other red cells and breaks them down, making matters worse. But what makes people think that that could be a vamp? I tell you, AIP. One of the common diseases, the acute intermittent porphyria, which famously afflicted the unfortunate King George III of Britain, the Mad King. In AIP, the most notable symptoms are neurological attacks such as trance, seizures, and hallucinations, which often persist over days or even weeks. 
Luckily, most people with AIP have a late inform and never develop any symptoms. So yes, a Ed. fun thing, really fun fact. Okay. Yo, go for so, it. Yeah. So the part of the reason why they say vampires can't see themselves, their own reflection is because of this man. He could not see his reflection because of the damage by sunlight to his eyes. So he literally believed he did not have a reflection because of the sun damage. That is where vampires yeah. not being able to see their reflection comes from. Another, another um, theory that I've heard also is that, um, Originally, mirrors are made of polished silver, and yes. that's like an old-timey anti-vampire thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, the funny thing is, though, a AIP has also been a hallmark of werewolf, of link entropy. Mm -hmm. Another relative common form is Porphyria cutanea tardia, which presents a very different spectrum of, of symptoms. In this case, the hallmark is photosensitivity. An excess reaction to light, which causes chronic blistering and even burns on sun exposed areas. Healing is slow and is associated with scarring and hair growth, especially on the face. Most of the time, the facial hairs are fine, so the heritism is barely noticeable. Sometimes, however, the hair can be given the appearance of a werewolf, leading to speculations that the myths may have a medical bias. Then we have in congenital. Ifropoietic porphyria, CEP, one of the rarest forms. 18 different mutations in the gene encoding the enzyme Europhyriogen 3 cosynthesis have been reported in different families. These mutations obstruct hemosynthesis to varying degrees. At worst, CEP causes appalling photomutilations from the light activated por 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 porphyrins, including loss of facial features and fingers, scarring of the cornea, and blindness. The condition has been less rare in the past, especially in isolated pockets where inbreeding could occur, such as the valleys of Transylvania, perhaps giving the rise to the tales of vampire. While the accumulation of perforins is usually caused by genetic mutations, toxins such as alcohol excess, environmental contaminants can also cause it. The most notorious episode occurred in Turkey in the 1950s where 4,000 people developed the form of porphyria after eating wheat seeds that had been sprayed with a fungicide hexochlorobenzene. Hundreds died and used the fungicide was later banned around the world. Whew. So how do people with porphyria survive? Blood or hand transfusions can supply some relief. And this is still the mainstay, mainstay treatment. Well, Interesting. Yes. There's about 20,000 people, I think, well, last time that I researched this, there's about 20,000 people that have this. And there are certain things that cause triggers. Uh, smoking, uh, fasting, um, base drinking, drugs, basically anything fun or anything like that. Well, any that. of these things that would affect the bloodstream. Yes. Think about it. If, uh, you can't, can, if you can't make new red blood cells and you're smoking, which mm -hmm. is going to then... Excuse me, thin out your blood. Drinking, which will thin out your blood. Mm -hmm. Ex oh. Fasting is going to go and do the same thing. Also, get funny. any infections that you get need to be treated immediately. And mm -hmm. if you're super emotional and have a lot of stress from that, that's also another trigger. But if if there is, there's no cure for this. But there is steps that can be taken. You have to get genetic counseling done to... Uh, to help live a more normal life, which so is... you're not really treating, you're just kind of managing it. Correct. You're surviving. Yes. It, it's rough. It's rough. So they can get infusions. And then this is actually one of the things that I really, really enjoyed. Interestingly, the hemp pigment is robust enough to survive digestion. And is absorbed from the intestine, even though the protein parts of hemoglobin are broken down. This means that, in principle, it is possible yeah, to relieve really the symptoms of porphyria by drinking blood. Another possible link with the vampire story. <sighs> Boy, these guys, they... It is rough. That is, it's just rough. It so, is. so now with genetic therapies and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to go and deal with, but it's... <laughs> It's a hard knocks life. Easier. It, 
He's, he, yeah, let's, 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 let's put up the quotes. You guys that aren't watching us and just listening to us, just, um, yeah. So I just finished putting up the, uh, the article for that. Please give it a read. It is worth every single read that is given to it. I, I love it. Um, born to the purple. What a beautiful, terrifying thing, isn't it? I will have to read that because I've never heard of that. Oh, please do. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. Once I heard it, I said, oh, that sounds scary. And I'm also going to put up the link to the Primate Diaries, the history of vampires. We're just going to talk about our surveyor from Serbia. And Arnold Pauli, I'm not going to go put up any information on it. A lot of it is kind of funny. But you, anyone that would like to go and do any reading on that, please feel free to. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about which I like quite a bit. Oh, and I'm also going to put up the story of Ambrosio, which, again, this one I'm a little bit off on because I couldn't find anything to back it up. Mm. But there's that. But let me find the last thing that we're going to speak about today. Sorry about that. So, there is something called Vampire Personality Disorder. Or, as academics have begun to call, Renfield Syndrome. As a true neurological disease. Have you guys ever heard of Renfield? Yes. Yep, I've read the book. So, to kind of help out a little bit, there is an actual book called Bizarre Diseases of the Mind and Vampires, Werewolves and Demons. The author Noel had noticed that some of these patients behaved like a demented character named Renfield from Bram Stoker's Dracula, a delusional mental patient in a lunatic asylum who eats spiders and flies to absorb their life. Dracula uses him to gain entry before enslaving him. Noel sold out as a human counterpart to the vampire. So late in 1990, when he was writing his book's introduction, he jokingly suggested that clinical vampirism be renamed Renfield Syndrome. Now, because I, I feel like scientists kind of have like their own little sense of humor, but you know how that is. The people with these symptoms of the syndrome, primarily male, and the blood is seen to have mystical quality. Things that can go and enhanced their lives. Um, so they began to follow a diagnostic protocol and identify the specific set of stages. The first stage is some event that happens before puberty, where the child is excited in a sexual way by some event that involves blood, injury, or the ingestion of blood. At puberty, it becomes fused with sexual fantasies. And a typical person with Renfield syndrome begins with auto-vampirism. They begin to drink from themselves. And once they go on from their own blood, they begin to move on to consuming from other living creatures. It's a very compulsive type thing. Now, a lot of people thought it was a joke. But in the Journal of the History of Neurosciences, published by Regis Ulrey and Dwayne E. Haynes' article, Renfield Syndrome, a Psychiatric Illness Drawn from Bram Stoker's Dracula, it wasn't funny anymore. It was real. And at this rate, they believed that it would actually wind up in books. The authors write quite seriously that the etiology remains unknown. Maybe that's because Renfield Syndrome doesn't actually exist on any established professional list. But clinical vampirism does. Psychiatry, uh, psychiatrists have long been aware of certain cases in which someone has a delusional notion that he or she is a vampire and therefore needs blood. The rises, this arises from, uh, not from fiction and film, but from an erotic attraction to blood, and the idea that it conveys certain powers, develops through sexual excitement. During the mid-1880s, German neurologist Richard von Kraft, Kraft, Kraftenbeek noted the sexual presentation of the attacks, and that they were compulsive and often aimed at a victim in a way that suggests lust. He included this in descriptions, the psychopathia sexualis. 
and we also have a little sample of that. A 25-year-old wine dresser who murdered a 20-year-old girl in the woods admitted that he also drank her blood, mutilated her genitals, tore out in a part of her heart, and buried her remains. It was also the man who cut off his arm for his wife to suck on before sex because it aroused her so strongly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Perhaps we need a little bit more info, I think. The Science of Vampires. Um, Miss Noll presents, I call the Vampire Personality Disorder, VPD. I included clinical vampires, but also killers compelled by bloodlust and people who exploit the vampire image to act out fantasy scenarios in a way that harm others. I even describe psychological vampires to encourage a codependent relationship so they can use up others' resources. But so far, no prodigious journal or diagnostic manual has taken VPD seriously. So, with that being said, I think it's important to, for us to kind of sit down and really think on it. As someone like myself who is involved in the kink, kink world and stuff like that, blood play is a very real thing. And it's something that happens more often than not. It usually also falls into things like blade play. So, and for those of you who don't know, and this is an adult podcast, so there are people that are sexually aroused by the presence of knives people that are also aroused by initiating small cuts to their lovers and drinking from them. I personally don't engage in it. I find it a little bit too dangerous for my liking. Not my thing. I think it's also important to put out that knife play can often lead to blood play, but d does not inherently mean you're... Correct. Yes. They can be mutually exclusive. Correct. They can be mutually exclusive. 150%. So, with all that being said, with all this knowledge being put out, are vampires real? No, not really. But the fact that there are so many different vampire legends all across the world, the fact that there are various genetic syndromes that cause symptoms similar to this, is there an explanation? Well, not, not to cause any trouble on people who are religious but i mean if you're religious and you you truly believe in the bible then of course there are vampires lilith is walking around and cain is walking around cursed to walk until end of eternity which reminds me of something by the way um kind of been off topic but bear with me to look back one of the one of the theories i've heard for the the origin of the myth of the sunlight destroying vampires mm -hmm. is because in many cultures and many religions the sun is seen as a manifestation <laughs> of god or sometimes literally even the face of god yeah so oh yes the ultimate holy presence would be you know the gaze it's literally the gaze of god incinerating the evil that's what it comes down to well let's take a look at uh, dante's inferno the last level of hell where satan himself presides freezing from the complete and utter lack of God's love present. Things to think about as we think about these wicked things and these wicked people. <clears throat> With that being said, we're coming to an end to our little vampire story. Sadly, I don't have, well, sadly, and thank God, we actually don't have any real vampires to go and speak of. Now, there are vampiric people out there, which you could probably go and find. The Atlantic Coalition of Vampires, please feel free to go and bring them up. I've been told that they're very, very nice people. I did not bother them. I left them be to their own devices. <laughs> I actually interviewed one for my campaign. I'm sure that they're absolutely oh, lovely. Yeah. Like, they were fantastic. Like, I have no doubt. <laughs> I really don't. Like, I feel like they're probably super duper nice and like super okay with talking about everything very open very <sighs> sweet like she was amazing to talk to um you and know, it, we corresponded over email and then she gave me a phone call and then i asked her my questions and she was fa you, amazing you know it's one of those things that i i 
uh, it, it's hard because I want to believe so bad in the supernatural. I really do. And for those of you who do not know, I practice Santeria. So we believe in the saints. We believe in the dead. We believe in vampiric creatures. These are all things that we believe in. But even then, I cannot bring myself to go and say vampires are real. I just, I can't, I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. I think it's but, something to say is it's equally horrifying to say that there is no such thing as supernatural beings or extraterrestrial beings, but it's also equally terrifying saying that there is. You're in a world that has it or a world that doesn't. It's so odd to go and think that if we truly are just alone in the void with nothing, just how terrifying just the thought of that is. But on a softer note before I end, we here are something wicked. Even though we take these things and sometimes we laugh and sometimes I give them a hard time. To believe in these stories, believe in the fantastical, is to give a spice to life that nothing else really does. There is a book called The Hogfather, and at the end, Death is speaking to his granddaughter, and he states, we have to believe in the big lie to be able to appreciate the little one. And in all truthfulness, the thought of something wonderful after all of this, the thought that there are things that go bump in the night, the fact that there could be something in luck, that there are entities that we cannot comprehend, nor explain, nor disprove, I think makes life better. And I truly hope that you can all agree. So even though I give it a hard time and I try to explain it all with science, in my heart of heart, I think that they make life worth living. So, there is that. It's funny you should mention the Hogfather. Join hmm. our Discord server on Shenanigan Tuesdays, uh, November 30th, to kick off our December uh, <laughs> festivities. We are watching the Hogfather, so be sure One to... Of my favorite christmas movies which i showed the guys last christmas daniel and so showed like us it. and i fell in love with death oh my god <laughs> it's so good it's so good and it and it's so fun and it's it's pretty much there's a group of people that send an assassin to kill santa that is the, like the basis thing i could go throw out there to you and death is involved the actual death and a whole bunch of other really fun people it's a great, great read, and it's a great, great miniseries. Yes. If you get a time, sit with your family, read it. You'll enjoy it. I enjoyed it very much, and I love sharing it. Come share it with us on just, uh, November 30th. And please feel free. And that's on Tuesday? Yes. Okay, so you guys are going to go and have my dumb ass go and pop up there to go in and, and spend some time with all of you. All right. So with that being said, let us all take a moment. And prick our thumbs. For something wicked. This way come. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you so much for spending time with us. We deeply appreciate you. Have an excellent weekend. We'll see you all very soon. Bye. 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 We are off. Oh, that was good. I think we had a good episode, guys. I got commented that someone was found it very amusing. I was getting excited about this terrible disease. And I was <laughs> couldn't stop smiling. So that there's a section of time I'm like just holding my hand over my mouth. I mean...